You know, most people are always looking for the best deal that they can get. You know, anything we look into, we're always trying to see what's the best one we can buy. We now, we now even like to compare things when we shop. You know, go, you go to Amazon, you look at all these different types of listings, you go here or there, you're always looking for the best. Even in, you know, in other things in life, we're always looking for what is the best for us. When we're looking for a job, right, we're saying, well, does it have a pension? Does it have health benefits, six days, vacation time? We're looking for the best package possible. When it comes to a career, same thing. You know, we're saying, well, is this the best school for me to go to? People that have graduated from here, they've mostly gotten who, when they, when they graduate from here, do they get a job? You know, what percentage? 90%, 80%, you know? If you, if you want to go to school and you find that only 15% of those people who graduate from that school actually get a job, you're like, well, I got to put my money there. You want to go somewhere where you know you're guaranteed to get a job, you're guaranteed to move forward. This is the way we think. Yet it's amazing that I find when it comes to spirituality, people don't think the same way. When it comes to spiritual things, people are, are not looking to say, well, what's the best? What is the truth? What is, what is most beneficial to me? On the contrary, they're looking for something that will make them feel good. Most people go to church and they, they want to feel good. They want to walk and say, oh, ah, that was so good. Or they want a religion that is the least inconvenient religion. I've noticed that a lot of people also. You know, okay, what does this religion demand of me? Whoa, that's, uh, yeah, we're not going to go to this one. I'm going to go to that one. When the truth is, what we should be asking is, is it true? Is this religion true? Because obviously if it's not true, it cannot give you what it says it can give you. If Christianity is not true, then obviously the benefits that it says it can give you, it cannot give you. But it's amazing how people are content on living their lives and not thinking about what is the truth. Because whatever is true, then they will certainly be beneficial. In this passage, Paul talks about that which is beneficial to us. That which, the benefits that come from being in Christ. But he didn't start that way. Remember, he started by talking about the depravity of humanity. Because if you don't realize you have a problem, then you, you won't look for a solution. If you, you know, like that's the, the whole thing in AA, right? The first thing, I've never been to an AA meeting. This is all rumors. Not a, I don't have an alcoholic problem. Uh, but I heard the first thing they say is, um, you have to admit you have a problem. That's the first thing. No one can take you there. No one can force you to go. You have to admit you have a problem. You know, just this week alone, I had someone on Facebook, a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine that I've known since I was a kid. Actually, probably one of the first persons I ever witnessed to when I was 15 years old, posting on Facebook uh, that he didn't like the fact that, you know, certain people talked about being lost and found and, you know, the whole, the whole Christian terminology. And so it gave me an opportunity to, to again witness to him, thinking, oh my goodness, he's, maybe he's departed from where he was. Because I know that he was there. So I started witnessing to him again about what that means for us. And of course, lost and found for us as Christians doesn't mean that we literally were lost. It wasn't like I was in Cliffside Park. I don't know where I am. I am lost. No, it's a metaphor. And you really don't realize just how lost you really are until you find Christ. But there is a point where you realize, I am lost. I do need Christ. Something is wrong in my life. And you look for that solution. And of course, there's all kinds of language, all kinds of metaphors. Not only lost and found, seeing the light, being born again. These are all metaphors for that great dramatic moment when we realize that we have a problem. And the only solution to that problem is Christ. And here in this passage, Paul now begins to talk about the benefits that come once we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the first one is peace with God. Look at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul goes through the whole gamut of salvation. We were justified by faith. We have peace with God and now we share and, we, and then one day we will share in God's glory. But he begins with this idea of the peace that we have with God. And now today we will say, oh, it's a beautiful concept. It's a wonderful thing to, oh, to be at peace with God. But we don't realize just how radical Paul's being for his time. First of all, he's critiquing the Roman Empire. We don't think of him critiquing the Roman Empire, but he is. Because if you remember, Julius Caesar and Caesar Augustus, they believed that they were the ones who were the savior of the world. They were the ones who brought peace to the world, Pax Romana. Of course, their peace came by violence. We will beat you to a pulp, and then you'll submit to us, and then you have peace. You know? Of course, that's not the peace of Christ. But Paul says, no, the real Lord is the one who brings real peace. You know, and, and we have to keep that in mind that the only one who can bring us real peace 
is God, is Christ. Because as individuals living in a wonderful nation, uh, too many times we get cozy with government. Too many Christians are cozy with government. They begin to love government. They somehow see government synonymous with Christianity. And somehow they think that this is the way it's supposed to be. And it's not. You know, before, before Constantine, Christianity was illegal. We were called atheists. We were beaten down. We were persecuted. Then Constantine made it legal. Then Theodosius is the one who really nailed us to the cross because Theodosius made it the religion of the empire. And then Christians started persecuting other people and it all turned around. Of course, we know the medieval times, the Renaissance, we know about you know, the Inquisition, we know about all these, things, all these horrible things that happened, the Crusades, all these horrible things because Christianity came to power and many people who were not believers came to church. Just like last week, this place was full, right? Because it's Easter and people get religious and they come in. But today only the elect are here. So, you know, but it's th that kind of shift that occurs when that happens, you know, when, when it becomes acceptable. Now, I'm not saying don't be involved in politics. Praise God we live in a nation where we can vote. Praise God we live in a nation where we can, we can elect people who are godly and good and wonderful. And I, and I certainly encourage young people who are considering going into, into politics to do so. Sure, definitely. We want young men and women who are Christian being the senators, being the presidents, being in charge of all these things. But as long as they never forget that they don't represent America, they don't represent the Republican Party. They don't represent the Democratic Party. They represent Christ. They are ambassadors of Christ. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you're an ambassador of Christ. You're not an ambassador of, of America or any other nation or any other place. You're an ambassador of Christ. And what happens is if we start thinking that our government is synonymous with Christianity, then we start feeling that the peace that America can offer is the same that the peace that God offers, and it's not. If America brings peace, it will be a temporary peace. And maybe, maybe even a peace by force, violence, but it will not be the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding. And so we must, be, we must keep ourselves divided from government. Be influential in government, but make sure that we are a prophetic voice that speaks out to government. So yes, I can support the president. I can pray for the president. If, I, if the president wants to be, be his advisor, I can be his advisor. But I must be the voice that can say to him, you are wrong when he is wrong. When he's gotten off the path, when he's not doing something that's Christ-like, to say, no, that is not good. We should not do it that way. This is what's so important. But we need to keep that in mind so that we don't mix up the peace of this world with the peace of Christ. Because when it comes to the peace that we have with Christ, it shows that we are at war with God. We were at war with God. We were in rebellion against God. And God is the one who's come forward. Even though we were the one at odds with him, even though we were the ones that are hostile, he's the one who came and offered a truce to us. And he did it through the person of Jesus Christ. And now this peace comes into our lives. But this peace is not simply an inner warm feeling. I'm not even sure Paul had that in mind when he said peace. You know, because Paul was not a 21st century theologian. He was a 1st century theologian. And probably those of you who are from other countries understand the whole corporate idea more than the individual idea. We as America always think individually. Oh, the peace of God comes to me, I feel warm. Hmm. You know? They don't think about it's the peace of God that comes to all of us. And there's a visible, tangible reality. You know, the, the Hebrew people call it shalom. Shalom. Gerhard von Rad in his Old Testament theology states that there is no specific text in which shalom denotes a specifically spiritual attitude of inward peace. Certainly we can say that the peace of God comes into us. But peace is more than a feeling. It's a reality. When God says, I have peace with you, we are reconciled. It's a reality. It doesn't matter what you feel. Because the fact is, our feelings change. And if we're de dependent upon our feelings, we are in trouble. You know, one day you're going to feel turmoil. One day you're going to feel despair, despair. One day you're going to be in your bed going, oh, my neck, oh, my back, oh, it's killing me, oh, God, where are you? You know, and if it's all feelings, then that's the time we abandon God. So many people abandon God because their whole relationship with God is based upon feelings. He makes me feel good. I feel right. I feel wonderful. What happens when you don't feel wonderful? Because there will be a time when you don't feel wonderful. And it might be the toothache on Tuesday. 
might be the cancer on Thursday, might be anything. There are times when you're not going to feel comfortable. There are times when you're going to go through difficult times. What then? If we're only dependent upon feelings, we are in trouble. C.S. Lewis, in his little book, A Grief Observed, um, which he wrote as, uh, after he lost his wife to cancer, states, Mean Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you are tempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. It might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so at once. And that seeming was as strong as this. What can this mean? Why is he so present a commander in our time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of trouble? The raw honesty of him to write that. When his wife is going through, he's like, where is God? I'm turning to him and I'm calling to him and crying to him. It's like, no one's home. No one's there. You know, the great thing was that his wife was also a devout believer and he shared these things with her while she was alive and struggling with, with, uh, with cancer and stuff like that. And she reminded him to not forget the Lord in the garden at Gethsemane and the agony that he endured and that he was on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he says something incredibly beautiful. At the end he says, she said, not to me, but to the chaplain as she's dying. I am at peace with God. And then she smiled, but not at me. And then he quotes in, in, uh, from Dante's, she turned to the eternal fountain. He saw that peace that she had with God and with Christ, that even as she's dying, she can say, no, I'm at peace with God. And when she smiles, she's not smiling at him. She's smiling at somebody else. And he's, and he's assured of that. But if all we had was feelings, we would be in trouble. And so many people, all they have is feelings. They feel peace. And then tomorrow when they don't feel peace, they feel that God is not there, that God is not real. The peace that we have from God is real. It is tangible. It is what he has done. You know, the cross of Christ is real. The, the resurrection is real. The peace of God is real. It's that tangible. Something you can, you can touch even if you can't feel it. Tomorrow you might not feel it, but if you really have it, it's really there. Because God has said so, not because you feel it. My goodness, if we only went according to our feelings. So the first thing that we have, the first benefit, is that peace that we have with God. That thing that says you were at war with him, but now you are reconciled with him. The second thing we have is access to God. Verse 2, Therefore, since you have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. It's not simply that we have peace with God. Oh, God and I have peace. But now I can come into his presence. And the word here, access, can refer to two things. It can refer in in, in the idea of the Hebrew idea of bringing a sacrifice to God that's acceptable, or more likely is the idea of the person that would lead you into the presence of a king, which in Greek, the same word is being used here for access. There were, when you went into a king's presence, you just couldn't walk in. That's how most go walking into the president, right? Imagine, walk right through the, the gates, walk right in through. I'm just going to go see Donald. Yeah, I go right, no, 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 no. You, you, get, you are escorted in, besides being checked over, make sure you have no weapons or anything. You're being escorted in. Well, in the ancient world, when you went into the presence of a king, somebody brought you into the presence of the king. You just couldn't go by yourself. Christ is that individual who brings us into the presence of God. Because of what he has done for us, and that he has established faith for us, he now brings us. But notice that the word he says is, not that he brings us into God, but grace. Because the very presence of God is grace. Everything we have is grace. Grace is God's unmerited 
favor. There is nothing you could have ever done. There's nothing you will ever do that will acquire the grace of God. Grace of God is just a freedom of who he is loving us unconditionally. That is God. You know, that's like children. You know, they can, they can really get you angry. They can do whatever, but they're still your children. And you love them unconditionally. And you give them all these things, even when they get you angry. Even when things go wrong. Because you adore, they are yours. We have that relationship with God. The grace of God. And Paul says, not only do we come into the grace of God, but we stand on the grace of God. And sometimes, you know, that's why I love translations, because... I think there have to be more paraphrased translations to explain this. He means not only do we come in, but we abide, we live, we have our security in, in that relationship that we have. We're able to stand. It's not like God allows us to come into his presence and then he's a fickle God. He says, well, I let you come in. You can stay here for half an hour, but then, ta-ta, get out. No, we stand. We live in the very presence of grace. Wherever I am, there I am in the throne room of God. There I am in his grace, standing. You know, and that's incredible because, you know, sometimes, again, going back to feelings, some Christians have the hardest time feeling at home in the presence of God. You know, there are many things in this life, unfortunately, that shake our security. They shake our sense of, 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 of being secure. You know, maybe it was your mother or your father who never made you feel confident, made, maybe they never made you feel secure in who you were. You know, always questioning you, always doubting you. Oh, you could always do better. Or you could, if someone's always picking on you, or always making your life difficult, or always threatening you, it's very difficult to establish that sense of security. You know, this morning we're laughing because... My daughter's downstairs and we're getting ready for church and she's singing. And I tell my wife, of course, she's got every reason to sing. She lives in a great, peaceful, beautiful, harmonious place. She doesn't know turmoil. If I could have taken her to my childhood, she would have said, oh my goodness, Papa, how did you make it? <laughs> how did you make it through all this turmoil? She has no turmoil. That's exactly what God creates for us. And yet there are people that in our lives that destroy that, that destroy that sense of peace and calmness and security, so that when God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, you hear it, you memorize it, but you doubt it. Something inside of you doubts it, whether God really will never leave me nor forsake me. Somebody hurt you so bad made you doubt the grace of God so bad that when you hear it from God, you, you're hearing them saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And they left you, they forsake you, they hurt you. This is where the analogy of God as father or as parent or as anything falls apart. We must think of God as father, but as an ideal father. We must think of him as ideal mother, an ideal brother, an ideal sister, an ideal spouse. This is why the psalmist can declare Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. J.E. Smith, in his book on the Old Testament, says, Though he is friendless and forsaken as a deserted child, Yahweh would adopt him and care for him. God's love is stronger than that of the closest human relations. The psalmist has that insight, yet we fail to have it. And we still think of God in terms of a physical father, a physical mother, a physical sibling, a physical spouse. Because we're the bride of Christ. And we think he's going to abandon us. He's going to cheat on us. He's going to leave us. He's going to hurt us. When he says he's going to be here forever, he's not going to be here forever. And God says, I'm not like that. On the contrary, right at that point where they have failed you, I will adopt you. Just at that point where your mother and father say, I don't want anything to do with you. I hate you. Get out of my house. At that point, God says, I want you. You will be my child. And I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. That's access into the presence of God. And that's terrible when you see Christians who live in fear or live in doubt, that they, they are uncomfortable. We should be so comfortable in the presence of God. We should. We should be able to come into God's presence and say, Abba, Father, Daddy. 
and not feel uncomfortable at all. To know that I'm always welcomed in his presence, that I live in his presence, and not having to dread that, oh my goodness, one day he will leave me. One day he will abandon me. One day he will give up on me. No. You might give up on him. You might fail him. You might be unfaithful, but he remains faithful. Remember Romans 3? He remains faithful. Despite us, he still fights with us. Even when, when you know, like C.S. Lewis once again said, when you feel that God is far, look at who really moved. It wasn't God that moved away. It was you who moved away from God. And God is constantly calling us. Again, we have the peace of God. We have access. And then the third thing that Paul mentions is the glorious hope that we have. Look at verse 1 and 2 again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his, into his grace, in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That glorious hope. You know, in, in the film, The Shawshank Redemption, there are two friends who have different perspectives. Both are prisoners, but Andy is hopeful and Red is pessimistic. Andy believes that he would die without a sense of hope, and Red believes that hope would cut him off from reality. And certainly those are two different worldviews. For Andy, hope is necessary. For Red, hope is a dangerous thing. Of course, eventually Andy wins uh, over Red, and eventually he writes to him, Hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. Hope is a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. If you didn't have hope, you would die. All of us live with hope. All of us live with expectation. You know, the young couple that's looking to forward to getting married, or they're looking forward to, forward to their first child, or they're looking forward to their first home, or they're looking forward to buying this or doing that. You know, we all have a hope. We always have that eye on tomorrow. You know, no matter what we're doing today, no matter how much we may think about the past, we always have that hope of what's going to occur tomorrow. We're always looking, you know, always imagining, you know, what our, what our children will be when they grow up. What will this happen? Will that? We're always looking towards the future and always planning towards that future, having hope. Of course, as I've said many times before, a hope is only as good as that which it is based upon. If our hope is based upon pipe dreams, then obviously, you know, you know I may hope that I get a good job, but if I'm sitting at home eating pretzels and don't go outside and look for a job, well, if I don't even look at the one ads, you know, some people, are not, you know, they don't look at the one ads, they don't go out to look for a job, they don't go for an interview, but they're waiting for that good job. I really believe I'm going to get it. And we're like, I believe you're not going to get it. Just got a funny feeling you're not going to get it. You know, hope has to be built on something realistic. And our hope, of course, the reason we can boast is because our hope, again, is on Jesus Christ. It's not on us. It's not on anything that I've accomplished. It's not on my degrees. It's not on my intelligence. It's not on my strength. It's on what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us on the cross. And this hope, of course, is not something that it's fully realized today. It's something that we see a part of it today. We see in part, but not fully. One day we'll see it fully. And of course, that hope is the full restoration of who we are. Full restoration of creation. Remember I quoted before Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I argued that it should be rendered for all have sinned and lack the glory of God. We lack that glory because of what Adam did, because of what humanity has done. One day we will have that glory again. One day we will be perfect even as he is perfect. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We are being transformed. We are in that cocoon stage. You know, we are being in that metamorphosis. We are changing. And one day, we will be glorious. Whatever it is that we have now, all the weaknesses, all the, all the struggles, all the things that happen in our bodies, all things that can go wrong in life, one day there will be a full transformation. And as we're going to see when we get to Romans 8, it's not just going to be simply a transformation of the human being. It's a transformation of creation. God doesn't create garbage. 
God didn't create all of creation, the universe, so he can go, okay, I'm just going to dump it. No, he's going to recreate it. He's going to redeem it, just as he has redeemed us. You know, and we look forward to that glorious day. I don't know about you, I do. I mean, I don't know if you ever, do you ever, do you ever have a foretaste? Have you ever had a foretaste of heaven? Foretaste of the glories that await us. And when you get that taste in your mouth, I don't know about you, but I feel like Enoch, you know? I feel like Enoch in, in Genesis 5. I want to walk with God and then not be, for God took me. You know? I would love to have that. That's a great way to go to heaven. The one day I'm in conversation with the Lord, I'm walking, you know, my body's there, poof, and I'm still walking, and I'm with him. Because once we have a foretaste of that, how glorious to taste all of it. As C.S. Lewis again says in The Weight of Glory, we want something else which can hardly be put into words to be united with beauty we see, to pass into it, to receive it into ourselves, to bathe in it, to become part of it. I don't want to see, just see the glory. I want to be in the glory. I want to be transformed by the glory. I want to share in the very nature of God to be like he is. This is my hope. And every time I get a foretaste, I'm like, yes, okay, awesome. You know, but again, as C.S. Lewis says at the end of that essay, he says, meanwhile, the cross comes before the crown and tomorrow is a Monday morning. Ooh, did you have to mention Monday? You know, that's the reality. We look forward to that great, glorious day when we will be resurrected, when we will have our brand new bodies, when we will be in the presence of God. But tomorrow, we have to bear the cross. Today, we have to bear the cross. Tomorrow is Monday. Tomorrow, we go back to the routine and all these things. But if we lose track of where we are looking at and where we need to keep our eyes focused, then we begin to doubt. Or we begin to focus more on our feelings. But the, cro the, the cross does come before the crown. And that's actually the next part that Paul goes into about suffering in our lives. Because we think about all the benefits we have in Christ. We know, all the peace, all the access, all the glorious hope. And we don't see suffering as a benefit of being in the presence of God of growing to be like him. But next week, I'll show you how it is part of, who, of, of that beneficial life that we have in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for your word that speaks to us and strengthens us. Help us, Father, to not let this world consume us, not let this world change our feelings or tamper with our feelings in a way where we lose track of who you are and what you have done for us. What you have done for us is reality, is the truth of the cross and the resurrection. And nothing can change that. No feeling, no heartache, no situation can change the reality of the peace that we have with you. And the fact that we can come into your presence and that we look forward, we look forward so desperately, dear Lord, to that day where we can be in you and share in your holiness and beauty. We thank you and praise you for this word of hope and expectation. Bless us with your Holy Spirit, not to let go of this, but to grow more and more in it. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.